Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining. Um, I'm Dagwan Che, I'm a general partner at Bond, and uh, we are a late stage venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley that has been investing together for the last 12 years now. And over those last 12 years, we have had the distinct privilege of backing and partnering many of the iconic companies that have grown from seed stage to IPO, maybe many that have passed through the slush stages as well. And uh, you know, from the early days of social companies like Facebook and Snapchat and Pinterest and Twitter to on the on-demand economies, businesses like Uber and Instacart and DoorDash, um, to the fintech revolution, businesses like Square and Stripe and Revolut and Plaid and many others. And I don't bring these names up just to make us look cool, although it does, but um, they are actually a subset of what Noradine and Yasir hope to accomplish um, as they scale a super app in continental Africa. And from very humble beginnings of a, an Algerian-focused ride-hailing application to now um, a, a business that spans five countries in continental Africa, doing ride-hailing, food delivery, grocery delivery, and payments, um, doing billions of dollars of volume with millions of customers, hundreds of millions of revenue, and growing very quickly. It's pretty um, extraordinary what the business has accomplished in a short amount of time. And so without further ado, I want to kind of get to Nouradine and, and how he scaled this platform. I think question number one that would be really interesting to hear is, what was the founding vision? Like, what was the idea at inception? And how did you decide to start with ride hailing from, from the first application in the business? Yeah, um, actually, when we first started, when we saw the opportunity um, was uh, on the FinTech side. So we wanted to get into payments. Uh, in the region we operate in, like, cash is really king. Over 90% of the transactions are still happening in cash. And if you look at why, why that is, it's not because of a lack of a banking system. The banking system is there. It's just that people don't trust it. And uh, the question that we posed ourselves is like, how do we get access to that cash? And when we look at statistics in the region, it just turned out that uh, pretty much a big chunk of household income was being spent in food uh, and groceries, uh, as well as uh, transportation. Uh, if you look uh, at food, for instance, the average family size is around 5.6 people. Compare that to Europe, which is 2.1, so you have a lot more mouths to feed. And then transportation, you have big cities with barely any public transportation. And when we first started, like on-demand services like ride-hailing, food, grocery delivery, it was pretty much in existence. So we're like, why don't we use them? They solve important and immediate needs. And of course, if we execute well, then we'll have a very large user base uh, that not only will it give us access to the cash, but will subconsciously trust us. And once you have that trust, then uh, you can start offering payment services. And what's cool about on-demand services, of course, which people don't realize, is that it's a multi-sided marketplace. So it's not just the consumers. Of course, you have the supply, who are the drivers and the couriers. You have the merchants. Today, we also connect merchants to FMCGs, wholesalers and distributors. So it's a whole virtuous circle that we've created and that we can tap into in terms of providing the payment services, but also utilize. So for instance, our merchants become agents where people can deposit and collect cash. Uh, our drivers and couriers are actually mobile agents. So at the end of your ride or at the end of your delivery, uh, you can give, say, like, say like your ride costs you $10. You can give the driver $100. Uh, $10 will go towards your ride, and then the rest can go into your mobile money wallet that you could use both in closed loop and open loop. So, so yeah, that was... Uh, uh, that was kind of, you know, like how we saw things from the beginning, uh, but then we had to start somewhere. Uh, so we decided to start with ride hailing because to us, it was a clear product market fit in a sense that, as I mentioned earlier, big cities with uh, barely any public transportation, uh, and uh, there was no player actually when we first started. Uh, and we were actually uh, like right on the money. Uh, I remember the first year we were able to grow very quickly. Uh, reaching like 50 million in GMV, 10 million in revenue, and we were profitable. And, we, and that was with barely any investment, actually. Uh, so, uh, and then we switched into the other verticals till we got to, uh, to payment recently. Yeah. And on that topic of there was no existing player in Africa, it's kind of a crazy concept when you think about the fact that Africa has over a billion people. Um, I think demographic trends there are maybe the most compelling globally. Like by 2040, the largest urban population in the world, surpassing China and India, you know, more than North America and Europe combined. Um, yet there was no real mass scale value creation event that's happened in the region. Um, even, I don't think you've heard this story, but even for, for us, when we got the introduction from Clio, and um, it was like, 
is it even worth meeting this company that's based in Algeria doing a ride-hailing app? And we have a saying internally at Bond, which is just one in doubt, take the meeting. And we're obviously very glad that we did. <laughs> um, and thank you for letting us be part of your journey. But why do you think this is? Why, why is it that a continent that's so large, that has such obvious tailwinds behind it, that's coming online, um, is not seeing the kind of value creation that you would expect? Um, and, and how did you tackle that and approach that as starting this year? Yeah. Um a few things here. Um, I think the first thing is that uh, what people, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, like most of the uh, population growth is going to happen in Africa over the course of the next 30 years. I think if I remember statistics properly, um, by uh, 2050, uh, you're going to have about like 1.7 billion just in Africa alone, which is about 80% of the total uh, world uh, growth uh, population wise. Um, and a huge opportunity, uh, and what comes with that, what, and that's what you know, like some people don't realize, is it's a super, super young uh, continent. Uh, I mean, if you just like, look at the countries we currently operate in, over 75% of the population is under 35. Um, usually very tech savvy, uh, very, uh, 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 like very open to what's happening around the world, and like huge opportunities, to be honest, um, and I think what people don't realize when they look at the, the African markets is that they just look at it from the eye of like, you know, uh, official numbers, you know, like what the World Bank shows, what the GDP in, in each country is, what the GDP per capita, but they don't look at the bigger picture. Um, so for instance, you know, some of the countries we operate in, uh, it's true that, you know, like you have the official numbers, but you also look at, uh, there's like a huge informal market, which comes from, you know, like from a, a, a cash heavy economy, uh, like Algeria, for instance, which is about $200 billion uh, GDP. Uh, it's estimated that there's almost an additional $200 billion uh, in the informal market. So officially you have, you know, like someone that is uh, jobless, but actually in reality has a side hustle uh, and has a quality of life that probably is as good as, you know, say like a middle class in, uh, uh, in Europe. So that's one. And then the second point, which is uh, what I mentioned, because it's a very young population, um, you have all these single young professionals that still live with their parents, um, especially female for cultural reasons. And so a lot of these guys actually contribute to the household income. So per household, the purchase power is actually pretty high. Um, and I think, you know, like understanding these nuances and, uh, and locking them uh, is what, you know, like, um, I think from outside the continent, people didn't see. Uh, and I think that's why uh, local champions like us you know, uh, are able to, uh, um, to add that value uh, and actually kind of you know, uh, crack business models that uh, people didn't think would work in the, in the region. Yeah. And to that, to that commentary, like, when you think about Africa as a continent, obviously it's a diverse set of countries. You know? they're, they're not all the same. Uh, French-speaking Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, etc. As you guys started from Algeria and then took the platform to Tunisia, Morocco, mm. Senegal, South Africa, I mean, these are all very unique countries. Um, what were some of the tactics or what were some of the approaches that you took? Um, how did you think about the sequencing of the expansion? And, um, and you know, what were some of the things that you did that were helpful in order to be successful across the, the launch yeah. strategy? Um, so our, uh, our main goal was to, I mean, as I mentioned, getting into payment services. And uh, kind of, you know, like Algeria was our first market. It was kind of our lab. Um, and that's where we tried things. We saw, you know, like what worked, what didn't work. Um, and uh, we played it on multiple fronts. Uh, there is, of course, you know, the strategy and execution. But there is also, uh, in a lot of the countries we were operating in, uh, uh, there was like a, a lot of legal vacuum uh, in terms of uh, what we were doing. And uh, that allowed us to understand exactly, you know, like what, uh, what we needed to do on different fronts, not just like in terms of the execution, but also in terms of like working with uh, decision makers uh, on coming up with laws that uh, actually were, uh, uh, were very helpful uh, in terms of allowing us, you know, like to expand very quickly. Uh, so once we actually got that playbook, we were able to actually reiterate it like in pretty much every country that we were operating in. And what really helped us um, was the fact that we were a local champion. Um, so something I don't mention is that, uh, uh, like you see, at least for me, is, is more than a company, it's a mission. And one of the missions was to actually empower the local talent and more so the engineering talent. Because the engineering talent doesn't have many opportunities, uh, unfortunately, in the region and ends up primarily coming to Europe to pursue studies or finding jobs. And uh, it was really important for us to empower that local talent and make, 
and show that actually that talent can uh, you know like uh, build uh, world uh, uh, scale uh, platforms, and that turned out to actually be a huge advantage to us because uh, when we started expanding into other countries, um, we started hiring engineering talent in each country we were operated in, and different like the governments in each country like saw us as um, an entity that was bringing so much value. And so it made the discussion super easy uh, in terms of, you know, um, discussing, you know, like the different legal vacuums, how we could do uh, to actually, you know, like fill in the gaps. Uh, and that's, you know, like overall with, I think, a product that was really built for the region. Uh, and uh, that pride that users uh, took from the fact that we were a local champion uh, was, uh, was it became part of our playbook, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard enough expanding from one country to another, but simultaneously expanding your product as well and, you know, having invested in companies in the ride hailing and food delivery and grocery and payment space. I mean, each of these are problems that in and of itself are incredibly challenging to solve. And there's a graveyard of companies that have attempted them. You guys were able to go from one to the other, to the other, to the other. Um, could you narrate a bit how that story played out and what were some of the challenges that you faced? And then as you guys scaled, how you overcame those challenges to really go from product A to product mm. B to product C and build this super app ecosystem that exists today? Yeah, totally. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we had that vision of getting into payments and really using on-demand services as kind of like a Trojan horse to get to it. Um, and we started with ride hailing. We pretty much did the ride hailing, uh, only ride hailing for about like two to three years. So it really allowed us to build the product, kind of you know, build the brand as well. Um, uh, and as I said, you know, transportation is a huge problem in the region we operate in. Um, and so once we were able to, um, to get that, um, and there was also like circumstances that pushed us to, uh, to move you know, quicker into other verticals. For instance, uh, we started back in uh, 2017, and so we operated ride hailing up to COVID. Yeah. And we were super lucky that we were starting to experiment with food delivery like just a few months before COVID. Um, and uh, that was not only a lifesaver, <laughs> uh, but it was actually the best opportunity to educate people during that period. Because when COVID hit, all of a sudden we had a user base that uh, trusted us. Uh, we had drivers that no longer had you know, things to do. Uh, and then merchants, which just a few months before, like, were, uh, were like, you know, well, oh, why do we need to work with you and give you, you know, like 20% of our uh, uh, revenue? Like, all of a sudden, everyone started, you know, like going after that. So it was a really great moment to educate all the sides of the marketplace, allowed us to actually keep growing through COVID uh, and build towards that, uh, that super app concept. And, uh, uh, and then we got into groceries and then payments. But really key to it was to, uh, uh, to understand the pain points of, of all the sites of the marketplace um, and build a product that would allow us to actually cross-sell uh, between the different uh, 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 verticals that we were operating in. Uh, and a lot of you know, like the on-demand services have uh, you know, many things in common. So from an operations point of view, uh, we, were able, we were able to tap into um, those uh, uh, you know, aspects that were so identical, and we just built on top of it. And I think you know, like as we grew and we were able to grow the teams and put the processes in place, it really helped us you know, like move from uh, one vertical to another. Uh, that's one. Two, on the payment side, um, I mean, people would think that you know, like cash is an impediment. We actually saw it as a huge opportunity. Um, of course, you know, like as you're dealing with cash, payments are actually happening as you're receiving your order. So if it's ride hailing, it's at the end of the ride. If it's at, you know, like food or grocery delivery, it's when when you uh, when you get delivered. And cash um, has a has a huge advantage. One, I mean, if you look at like all the platforms around the world, especially like in the Western world, um, if you look at you know like the revenue costs, like a huge chunk of it is coming in payment processing. Uh, for us, we didn't have to deal with that. So, like our unit economics, like works super well. Uh, uh, like one of the reasons our unit economics work well is, you know, cash. And then uh, two, because we all, we were always eyeing payments at the end. Uh, what we did was that we built a way to uh, to collect that cash in a very automatic way, uh, in a super simple way actually. So we have uh, usually our drivers and couriers that collect the cash. 
Uh, and then we found uh, like a way for them to actually deposit that cash. And we can reconcile the amounts that are deposited like in a very uh, automated fashion. Um, and that allows us now to actually use that process uh, to provide wallets. Because our drivers, couriers, and merchants are the ones collecting that cash for us uh, and uh, depositing it for us. And then we can reconcile those amounts in a very seamless way, costing us pretty much zero dollars. Yeah. And I think the last question that I want to ask is about what advice that you would give to founders. But maybe even before we ask that, um, one that I'd slot in. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that we found really impactful about Yasir when we invested was the mission that you have. Mm -hmm. And the way that that mission, especially in a part of the world where you're solving net new problems and really adding products and services to consumers for the first time, as opposed to you know, introducing a, a 1 to 10 product, um, how is that, first of all, what is your mission? Um, and how has that mission allowed you to either hire, recruit, or build your company in a way that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's led to where you are today? Yeah, um, so, uh, so maybe I need to give a little of my background here, because um, it's kind of tied up to that. So, so I'm from Algeria, so that's where I was born and grew up. But then I spent pretty much all my adult and professional life in the US. Um, I, uh, I went to Stanford for grad school, and then uh, worked in the Valley, first in big tech, and then took the entrepreneurial path. And to be honest, me going back to the region where I'm from wasn't part of my plans. It just that at some point I wanted to uh, give back to the region, and so I started getting involved in, um, I would say like in a passive way, by mentoring teams, sometimes even actually writing small checks to teams that I liked. But to be honest, kind of like quickly, I came to realize that the biggest problem in our region, I mean, people always complain about lack of funding and bureaucracy as being the biggest impediments. And I'm not saying those weren't, uh, but to me, it was also the quality of the entrepreneur, him or herself, uh, meaning that there wasn't really, you know, like, uh, like the values, the mindsets. And I kind of made me conclude that if I was serious, I should get involved myself, at least try to attempt to, you know, build that local champion that could be emulated by others. And to me, of course, you know, the best way of learning is by doing. And so really my dream when we first started was that each and every person that would go through Yasir would uh, one day hopefully start his or her own company uh, and hopefully do even better and will be there to, uh, to support them. Um, and uh, and that, was, that was really kind of like the mission and still is. Uh, the second one, which I mentioned earlier, is, was really to empower the local engineering talent and show that you know, like talent uh, would, uh, would be able to you know, like build great platforms. Uh, and I'm happy to say that today we became the largest employer of software developers actually in the whole North Africa. Um, so, uh, so, so we're building, you know, like impact step by step. Um, and at the end of the day, kind of like sold a dream. And, you know, people started believing in that dream. Uh, and I think um, that kind of, uh, you know, like mission uh, really sticks with, uh, uh, with people. To the point that, honestly, like at some point, on, especially on the engineering side, uh, we started needing, you know, like more folks that had the experience and expertise. And as I mentioned earlier, like a lot of the folks that couldn't find opportunities in, in the region had to leave and primarily come to Europe. Now, it's actually the other way around. Like a lot of the folks that went to Europe, say, like worked for uh, the big companies here in Europe, whether that be, I don't know, like Delivery Hero, Klarna, uh, Vault, you name it, are coming back and actually joining us. So, so we're kind of like inverting the, uh, the process. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And especially in these times where, you know, the valuations are going up at the pace that people got used to in 2021, et cetera. You know, having a business that has a clear mission and is impact oriented and has a story for why uh, it deserves to exist and, and the impact that it has, it seems like that's also been a really powerful way to hire, retain talent in a way that's pretty unique as well. Um, so final question on our end. When you think about what you've accomplished, it is really breaking new ground. You know, starting a country, starting a company in a country and in a geography that has had you know very limited consumer businesses that have scaled, very little, very limited IPOs. Um, what advice would you give for folks that are similarly trying to break new ground, either in a new emerging market or with a new product? Like, what are the things that allowed you to have either the confidence to scale um, or along the way maybe some of the challenges that you faced that if you could do it all over again, you would you would give this advice back? Yeah, uh, look, I think the first one is, uh, is just believing in what you're doing. I think it's super important. Uh, I always say that an entrepreneur is someone that defies the status quo. So if you're waiting for a red carpet, then you'll, you'll never be able to, uh, to do anything. Uh, I think that's really important. Um, you're going to be operating in a region where 
everything would actually start from scratch. I mean, like sometimes you know, like we had to build the infrastructure for so many things to actually be able to use our products. Uh, so having you know, like that perseverance and always you know, like finding solutions to problems you're going to be facing is crucial. Uh, that's one. Uh, two, of course, you know, like it's it's a team that you surround yourself with. Uh, whether that be you know your team, you know, like that is actually building a strategy and execution, but also you know like the people that um, uh, that can help you take things to the next level. Whether that be um, you know uh, potentially uh, advisors or uh, uh, investors, you name it. I think that's really important. Uh, three in the region we operate in, there isn't as much capital as you know, like you find in the U.S. or um, Europe or the rest uh, other parts of the world. And I always tell you know people that you know capital now is uh, uh, is global. I mean, you, you can see us right, like we were operating in North Africa. And if you look at our cap table, pretty much all our investors are outside of the region. Um, and uh, so it's really important to seek that capital, you know, like wherever that is. Um, and uh, and that that will really be key. Uh, to creating wealth in the region. And once that wealth is actually created, that wealth will actually pass down to hopefully, you know, like new, uh, 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 new ventures. So, uh, so yeah, honestly, I mean, like these are like the, uh, the three main points. Uh, and then th I would say like the last one is really be clear uh, in terms of like the strategy and the execution that you want to have. Have clear, you know, like KPIs, OKRs, uh, but then also always listen to the market. Uh, you know, like as you start executing, uh, the market will tell you what's going to work, what's not going to work. You know, like don't be kind of like stubborn and say, oh, uh, this is the product, I'm sure it's going to work and try to force it on the market. Uh, it's actually usually the other way around. And so uh, always build product that the market wants and not the, uh, uh, not the opposite. Yeah, no. No, it's, it's incredible to, to hear you say it because no. I think when we invested in the business, it was also... Um, in some ways, so strange that we would back a company that's based, you know, headquartered in Algeria and, and operating in continental Africa. But when we unpack the onion on the opportunity, um, on what you've accomplished to date, but really what the, what the future holds for the continent and then for the platform, I mean, across things are in payments, but even beyond that to e-commerce, um, there's really a lot of new ground to break. And it's, uh, it's, been, it's been an honor working with you so far. So thank you. Same thank, here. Thanks, Anuradine. Thanks so much, thanks. guys.